if we really boil down uh, Christianity and the hope that we have, um, what our faith is all about, and what our salvation rests upon, um, most simply it boils down to a relationship. Uh, we have faith that the cross of Jesus Christ is sufficient to wash away our sins. That the perfect blood of Jesus, um, when we receive that by faith, that he died on the cross for our sins, washes us and makes us clean, makes us whole, and makes us holy. And after we've been washed in the blood, that we are filled with his Holy Spirit, even in our imperfect condition, by grace, through his faith, we are filled with his Holy Spirit. And that these are not just theological or theoretical or philosophical things that we believe. These are real, these are realities. These are spiritual realities. And so what we're banking on is that we're saved. What we're banking on is that we um, have received salvation. What we're banking on is that when this body dies, the spirit inside of us will continue to live. And when we're brought into the presence of God and he makes the final judgment on our life, that he will see us as clean and unblemished because of the grace of God through the sacrifice of Christ. And that when we're there, that that would have been so effective that when we look at Jesus and he looks at us, though we have never physically beheld him before, we have spiritually known him intimately, and we have a relationship. We're basically banking on the fact that the cross has brought reconciliation, a relationship with God on earth even before heaven. And indeed, the scriptures teach us that when we come into that time and that place at the very end, he's going to look at us and we're going to look at him. And it will not matter what theology we quote, what creed we might know, what church we went to, or what our reputation was on earth. What's going to matter is that we know him and he knows us, that we're known as well as him. And so he's going to look at us and he's going to say one of two things. He's going to say, I know you or I don't know you. If I know you, come on in to the Father's joy and your eternal place in the kingdom of God to salvation and everlasting relationship with me. And no matter how religious we are, if he looks back at us and he did not know us, he's going to say, away from me, you evildoer. I've never, ever known you. If you had truly believed, you would have been washed in the blood. If you had truly believed, you would have been filled with the Holy Spirit. If you had truly been filled with the Holy Spirit, you would have recognized my voice ever increasingly through time. We would have had an increasingly intimate relationship. Reconciliation is a real thing. So that's what we're banking on. Now, one of the greatest assurances we can have, the greatest evidence that those theological things are a real thing to us, is in our relationships with one another. If the grace of God has brought me into a right relationship with God, the ability to love God, uh, the first command has been kept, then the second command is that I be able to love one another um, as I love myself and I love others as Jesus has loved me. And so if that's true on a human level, um, I would say it is even more exalted um, between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, the most intimate of human relationships. If we both love Jesus, if we both ascribe to be Christians, if we have both been filled with the Holy Spirit, then the, the intimacy that we are beginning to enjoy with Christ should bring an intimacy that we begin to enjoy with one another. There's no greater evidence um, that grace ripples through our personal relationships. Um, so, several thousand years ago, um, this book was written, The Song of Songs. Um, it's called The Song of Songs, I think. My theory is uh, that because a man wrote it, and it's about sex, and he was kind of joking with his friends. He's like, hey, this is the best song. Uh, like we say, the King of Kings, Christ is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. There may be kings, but he's the greatest king. Uh, this is kind of the writer saying, hey, there's a lot of songs, there's good songs, there's elite songs. But this is the Song of Songs. This is the best song. Anyway, this was written several thousand years ago, and it's about a man, and it's about a woman, and it's about uh, two human beings who are in an almost perfect relationship as husband and wife. Um, it creates for us a vision. It creates for us an ideal. It says to us, um, as you are being reconciled to one another on earth, it should begin to look like this. Um, it is sexually explicit. Um, because it should be. Uh, if you're going to talk about intimacy and reconciliation 
and, and, and all these things in the context of a man and a woman and a marriage relationship, then sexuality is going to be all over the place. Uh, we were created as sexes, male and female. We were created uh, for the two to become one, spiritually and physically. We were created to create new life through physical intimacy. We were created as sexual beings. Um, it is pretty dominant in, in our being. It is pretty hardwired into us. Um, but it's more than just being erotic. The poem is also very much and even more so about um, intimacy and the sense of being vulnerable and the sense of being open in the sense of trust, in the sense of being safe, um, in the sense of having our desire and our affection reciprocated, uh, in the sense of being faithful and devoted to one another to the exclusion of anything or anyone else. Um, it's about equality in desire, equality in devotion, and exclusivity. And so those are probably the greater themes that we'll see as we go through the book in, in, in sec sex itself um, is the natural consequence and the kind of relationship that God has created for us. And so for those of us who are believers and married, or for those of us who are believers and one day hope to be married, uh, whether we're married, whether we're single, whether we're widowed, whether we're divorced, whether we're hoping for remarriage, or whether we're hoping we never actually love another man or woman again as long as we live, um, this speaks to us. It informs us, it instructs us, but maybe more powerful than that is these words are, uh, I think, very powerful and effective um, to heal, uh, to speak truth into some areas of our life where we've been inundated with lies, to bring truth, to bring love, to bring healing, to bring an ideal, to bring a vision, um, yes, to instruct, um, but also to work mysteriously, like transcendently, uh, to bring healing. And so, um, as we read through this, this is kind of like God saying, this is what it should look like. This is the way it should be. This is the ideal. This is the standard. You may be falling short of it. You may fall short of it your entire life, but this is what you're aiming at. And you hope to see this um, be your reality in your most intimate relationship ever increasingly through time. This is what it looks like. Now, chapter 2 begins with her speaking, as chapter 1 began with her speaking. Uh, what is really interesting throughout this entire poem is that the woman seems to be the greater pursuer. Uh, I think one of the greatest themes, as I already said, that comes out of this is equality. And we often think as a man being the pursuer and the woman playing hard to get. But in this particular case, uh, the poet is very um, intentional about making the woman the pursuer. And I think the reason that he does that, as I said last week, is to make it clear to his audience that there, this is about equality, equality of desire even. This is not about simply one person running after another one and they eventually give in because they make a lot of money. Um, this is about a man and a woman equally desiring of one another. Probably didn't need to write it so much about the man because that's obvious. It certainly was obvious in the time that it was written according to gender roles. It continues to be obvious according to our gender roles. But I think the poet wanted to make it clear that this was an equality of desire and they pursued one another. Anyway, it begins with her speaking today and the first line really isn't about pursuit. Um, it's, a, it's her own description or her own definition of herself. This is really interesting. Uh, the first two verses, um, three verses maybe, uh, we're going to spend a good bit of time on because it, it, it demonstrates something that's very complex and important um, and I think fundamental in our relationship with one another. Anyway, in verse 1, she begins by uh, saying something that at first appearance will look like a boast, but it actually um, is quite contrite. She says in verse 1 that I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Now, like I said, uh, that looks like she's exalting herself. She's saying, I'm a rose, I'm a lily, I'm beautiful. Uh, a rose in our culture is like, you know, the most expensive flower that you buy your wife or your loved one on Valentine's Day, right? It's an exalted thing. Um, but the way she's using that phrase and speaking of the lilies is actually uh, quite contrite. Um, she's saying, basically, I'm pretty common. Uh, uh, the Rose of Sharon grew en masse on the western foothills of Israel. 
A lily in the valley was beautiful, but it grew among millions of lilies in the valley. Imagine going to Colorado and being in a meadow during springtime, and you see all these beautiful flowers, and what takes you aback is not the beauty of one of the flowers, but the fact that there are so many flowers that look absolutely identical. And what she's saying, we know she has self-esteem from chapter 1. We know that she's not being self-deprecating, but she is being humble, and she's being contrite, and she's saying, I may be beautiful, but I stand among many, many beautiful women. Uh, there's nothing special about me. Now, this uh, may seem like fishing for a compliment, but she didn't really say this. A poet wrote it, and he wrote it for a specific purpose. He's trying to demonstrate something about beauty. In verse 2, um, it elicits this response from her lover. He responds by saying, if you're a lily of the valley, then, then this must be true from my perspective. He says, you are a li- like a lily among thorns. Um, like a lily among thorns is my darling among the young women. So she comes out and she says, I'm a common flower. And he comes out and says, well, you may be a common flower, but that means all the other flowers are not flowers, they're thorns. Uh, the poet is trying to make the point that what she is saying is objectively true. It's objectively true. Um, She's very common. Uh, I would say we're all kind of common. There's nothing uh, about us that is extraordinary, massively extraordinary, over and against one another. Um, why Why was my wife attracted to me and not the guy she dated before me who happened to be a doctor and made more money was a miracle, first of all. Um, But it wasn't because I was special in an objective sense. Um, The poet wants to make the point that this woman is beautiful, but she's not extraordinarily beautiful in an objective sense. Objectively, what she's saying is absolutely true, but her beauty is enhanced through the eyes of her lover. Her beauty becomes extraordinary through the lens of the one that she loves. Um, Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and beauty, when it is truly found and defined, is not objective, it is subjective, and it is very personal. And so I feel like what the poet is saying is, these two, throughout the poem, you're going to read how beautiful they are. He is not going to quit talking about uh, how she is the most beautiful of women. Uh, She is not going to quit talking about how he is the most handsome of men. And objectively, that is actually not true. They are quite common, as we are all quite common. But subjectively, in the eye of the beholder to one another, that is absolutely true. And and the lesson for us is that we do not, and we should not, and it is absolutely destructive to intimacy if we do, um, judge one another and base the the beauty of our, our beloved on objective standards. And in here we see a key even to fidelity. When he says, like a lily among thorns, what he's saying is, uh, I see all these women out there, and you're the only one that I would consider a flower. As a matter of fact, you are so beautiful to me, subjectively to me, because God has given me eyes to see who you really are. He's given me a special heart for you. That you are so beautiful to me, and I am so devoted to you, and my love is so subjective and so pure and so right and so unlike anything else we see in this world, that all these other women, no matter how objectively pretty they may be to the world, are absolute thorns to me, uh, unattractive to me. Uh, I'm repelled uh, by them. And, And my power for devotion comes from my ability to see my wife or to see my husband as Christ sees them, as only Christ will give me eyes to see them because I see things in them that no one else can see in them. And it's a beauty that even exceeds their physical attributes. It's a beauty of soul. It's a beauty of spirit. It is a gift. It is subjective and it's to the exclusion of anything or anyone else. And the poet wants us to get this about these two because this is a vision for our future. 
And if we read this wrong, we're going to say, well, he was objectively really a good-looking guy, and she was objectively really a good-looking girl, and the guy I'm married to is objectively not a very good-looking guy, and the girl I'm married to is not objectively a really good-looking girl, and we're basing their looks on objective information, on cultural norms, rather than on what God shows us about them. Uh, I hope today that brings correction, but I also hope it brings inspiration, because God has the capacity and will give you eyes to see your spouse in a way that is absolutely exclusive for you. And it is absolutely foundational for a healthy and intimate marriage. In verse 3, it says, like an apple tree among the trees. Uh, This is her speaking back to him. And so he's just given her this wonderful compliment um, and, and done so by contrasting her to the other women as a lily among thorns. And one of the things we see that the poet does throughout this entire thing is he brings incredible balance, equality to every emotion, every desire, every thought. Uh, This is not pandering. This was not her fishing and him responding. This is her telling an objective truth for our edification. This was him giving a subjective truth, which stood in contrast to that for our edification. And now this is her making a statement that is absolutely true from her heart as well that balances her out with him because there's always reciprocity. That's part of vulnerability. That's part of trust. And it's essential for intimacy uh, that we feel uh, mutually devoted to and affectionate to one another. And so she responds and brings the balance. She says, yeah, well, you know that is subjectively true about me. Let me tell you what is subjectively true about you. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. Um, I may be a lily among thorns, but you're an apple tree among pine trees. And when I'm walking through the forest, I got all these boring, skinny, little, raunchy little trees with pine cones on them. And I look, and then there's this beautiful, sprawling tree, and, and it looks better. And, it, and, and, and those apples, they, they look good, and nobody else has got any apples. And, and it puts off a scent, and I'm drawn to you physically, and I'm drawn to you by what I smell, and I'm drawn to you by what I feel. And I go right past all those pine trees or whatever they might be, and I go right to the apple tree. And she's saying, I feel like you exactly as you feel about me. I am so attracted to you that I am unattracted to anyone else. Uh, We are subjectively hearing the truth about one another. Uh, What we also see in her statement was that she delighted to sit in his shade. She uh, adoringly submitted to him. She uh, was drawn to him. She desired him. She also found protection and his covering, and she adoringly submitted to him, probably sexually, but most certainly in in every other way. And then she went on to say, his fruit is sweet to my taste, meaning intimacy. There's probably an innuendo in there, but it's too early in the sermon for me to go there because I don't want to be embarrassed right now. Just figure that one out on your own. So we have this balance. We have this equity. Uh, They love each other to the exclusion of anyone else. And it's been completely established, a foundational uh, part of this entire poem. In verse 4, we have an interesting verse. This is just kind of thrown in there, it seems to me. It it seems to be, um, everything seems to be leaning towards intimacy, personal intimacy, private intimacy. But then there's kind of this public statement um, in verse 4. And I think this is a really important statement, and I love that it's inserted the way it is um, right in the midst of all of this. In verse 4, she says, Let him lead me to the banquet hall, and let his banner over me be love. Now, some commentators read that, and they they sense, um, basically, she's saying, Let him grab me by the hand and take me to a banquet hall, which would be our private little banquet hall, because we're going to party. And let his banner over me be love while we're partaking in this really, all these really intimate acts. Um, that is one view on this. There's another view on this, and I, this is my view, that in the midst of this, she's actually talking about something that is very public. Um, she's, saying, she's saying, this man is not afraid to give me his name. Uh, this man is not afraid to publicly praise me before his friends, family, and the world. Uh, this man is utterly unashamed to make me his own. In our context, this man 
is unafraid um, to go to the church of the hotel or the banquet hall or wherever it might be to set up a bunch of chairs, invite everybody we know and a few people we don't know that well, and in the presence of all these people stand before God and them and publicly profess not only his love for me, but his covenant love for me, his commitment for me until death do us part, to love and to share, cherish uh, till death do us part. To me, this is an allusion uh, to, their, to their wedding banquet. And, and let his banner over me be loved. That's another way of saying, um, uh, let his banner over me, which is his name, uh, be love. Let him be proud of me. This is, uh, you could use this verse very much in context of Christ and his church and the way he feels about us and what will happen at the wedding banquet of the Lamb in heaven, as Scripture teaches us, where we, his bride, collectively the church, the sons and daughters of his father and, and his beloved will come and we will be at a wedding banquet and we will be the bride. And he will be unashamed despite our sin and despite our unfaithfulness because of his love for us, because of the blood and the spirit and the intimacy and the relationship that has developed before us. He will be unashamed um, to give us his name. We are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. Unashamed to publicly um, praise us and to celebrate that we share a name. And this is her saying, he's not ashamed of doing that with me and I'm not ashamed of doing that with him. Again, great equality here. She, she says, let him. I want him to. I don't want him just to make a covenant statement to me. I want to make a covenant statement to him. Uh, I, I will give up my old name to take on his new name. I don't need a maiden name. We have one name because we are now, the two have become one. We're in one spirit and we're in one flesh. And even though many of the things that we have are private and many of the things that we enjoy are intimate and none of everybody else's business, as far as the world is concerned, this is, this is not something we're ashamed of. This is not something we hide. We stand in the assembly of all the people and say, we are together till death do us part. And those who bless us will be blessed and those who curse us will be cursed. We are one. Now, I think this is incredibly important in the context of a sermon that's all about sexual intimacy because some of us here are very sexually intimate but not very publicly praising it. Uh, it's very easy, it seems, to develop sexual intimacy um, quicker than, more powerfully than, we develop commitment. And so what I would say to you men and women equally, because it's all about equality here, if you're in a relationship with someone who wants private privilege without public praise, then you need to get out of that relationship. You need to let that end. Because there's something off, there's something wrong. If they're not willing to take your name, if you're not willing to take their name, if you're not willing to be one publicly, then there is something very destructive long-term about a relationship where you give yourself away to someone who will not claim you. Uh, to their brothers and sisters, to those uh, that they know and love outside of your relationship. In verse 5, it says, Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. So we're right back to the weird stuff. Uh, raisins and apples, it's like an energy drink in the good old days. Uh, it would have been raisin cakes and some people think that the raisins and apples could have been aphrodisiacs. I don't think that that could possibly be true because she seems plenty enthralled with him. She doesn't seem to knew that, need that, but she does need energy. And so it's a little weird because she's talking to somebody outside the context of the relationship. Again, this is poetry. This isn't real life. She's talking to somebody outside the context of the relationship, and she's saying, hey, can you throw me a Red Bull? Uh, this guy has got me all tangled up. He's holding me up. He's going in for more. I want more. I don't know how I'm going to do this. This is exhausting psychologically, emotionally, physically, wonderful, and incredibly exhausting. And she's just rejoicing in their intimacy and, and, and just the, uh, uh, the intensity of it. And then she pivots in verse 7 and says, Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the, the gazelles and by the does of the field. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. 
So she's just talked about this incredible, intense experience where she needs extra food to get through it. And then the next verse, seemingly playfully, she talks to the daughters of Jerusalem and she says to them, uh, let me tell you something, as good as this is, you better be ready. Uh, this is psychologically, emotionally, physically, this is just exhausting. And so in one sense, she's being playful, but in another sense, I don't think she's being playful at all. I think she's being quite serious. I think in the midst of this intimacy and in being in, in, being in this embrace, I think, I think she's realizing this is good. This is very, very good. Um, this is better than I could have ever imagined it being. Uh, I've been married t- for 10 years, and, and one of the things you'll hear out on the street is sex isn't everything that it that it's you know made up to be i i don't i think it's one of the things that actually lived up to it's you know billing and she's saying this is good and and it is very very good but i think she's also imagining this level of intimacy this level of vulnerability this level um of openness without you know the commitment coming alongside of it not just a willingness to publicly proclaim our love for one another in the context of marriage which some people can enter into quite lightly if they have no devotion to god Um, but but this needs to be right because if it's good it's very good and if it's bad it could go really really bad and he's probably i feel like she's saying you know you might want to take it a little bit easy on those dating sites Uh, you might not want to decide you're going to you're dating uh, as soon as you, you know, go on the first date. Um, you might not want your emotions to get ahead of your head so fast. Because I have utterly given myself to this man, and he is absolutely worthy of it. Our desire is, is equal. Our devotion to one another is equal. This is real. This is happening. This is covenant. This is from God. But if this wasn't from God, it could be incredibly destructive. It could be terrible. So daughters of Jerusalem, I know you're looking at this. I know you're excited about this. I know you're celebrating this. I know you want what I have, and I understand that you do because I used to be like you and I wanted what I saw other people have. But I want you to know as good as this can be, it can also be bad. And you better know that you're in the right place at the right time with the right person, and the right timing is absolutely essential for that as well. It's a warning that love can go very, very wrong in the hands of the wrong person. In verse 8, we pivot to a new poem. This is actually technically poem 8, but it really doesn't matter when one ends and another begins. Um, but this one begins, um, and, and it, seems to, um, it seems to indicate that there's been a period of separation um, between the two, between the man and between the woman. There's been a period of separation, and the separation isn't because of any fight or anything. It's like he went off on a business trip or to work or to work the field. There's just been a period of separation, and nothing scandalous about it. They've just been separated, and now they have the excitement um, of coming back together. And so in verse 8, it says, Listen, my beloved, this is her speaking because she's anticipating his returning home. She's looking out the window waiting for him to come home. And so she's looking out the window and, and she sees him, and she may even hear him coming in the distance. She says, listen, my beloved, look, here he comes. And then she uses some really interesting language. She says, here he comes leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. Um, I'm excited to see him. He's excited to see me. Uh, I'm looking out the window and anticipating his coming. Uh, and he's so excited to get here, he ain't just walking. He ain't just running. He's leaping. He's skipping. He's giddy. He probably doesn't know I can see him because he looks kind of silly, but he can't wait to get here. He said, my beloved is like, she says, my beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. A gazelle would be something beautiful and elegant and and powerful, kind of like a ballet dancer, but she doesn't want, you know, to leave it there. So she says, or a young stag. So it's like a beautiful, uh, powerful ballet dancer who's really masculine. Stag is a sign for masculinity. And so she says, look, there's my masculine ballet dancer. There he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. It appears at first he's like a peeping Tom. Something weird is happening, but he's not. He, he gets right up to the boundary of where they are, and he pauses for a moment. And he pauses for a moment uh, because, one, the poet makes him pause for a moment because they're building some anticipation. They're kind of, uh, we're kind of dabbling in um, 
what it means when true love separates and gets to come back together, building some anticipation and some excitement about what is to come next. And then she quotes him. This is him speaking, but her quoting him. She says, my beloved spoke and said to me, and she said that he said, arise, my darling, my beautiful one. Come with me. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in the land. Uh, there was a time for work, and now there's a time for play. And now it's like springtime, and springtime is for lovers. Sometimes when I get home from a business trip, going to California or somewhere, and I come home and I get out of the car and I stand out in the driveway and I don't enter in immediately. I just quote this verse to Elaine at the top of my voice. And I get in late at night sometimes and lights come on and people look out. The, but, you know, we, we want to be a biblical couple. And I say, arise, my darling. She says, come in and shut up. <laughs> anyway, he's excited to see his woman and she's excited to see him. And, and, and the scarcity of their time together has enhanced their desire for one another. And in a sense, not too much scarcity, but just the right scarcity can be good for a relationship. There's nothing like increasing value by diminishing supply. Lower supply means higher demand. If you oversupply demand, we begin to take for granted something that's wonderful and we have too much of. So uh, they're recognizing this and they stop and they pause and they enjoy the tension and they enjoy the anticipation. He goes on to say the fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. Uh, just like you know me out in the street in our neighborhood when I get home. And he's saying... Uh, our time apart, I really don't think the season is as essential as where they are emotionally. It's springtime for them. And he's saying our time apart has made us right. We are ripe for one another. We are ripe. We are ready for one another. Um, we, are, we are at the peak of our desire. Uh, we have been on the vine. We have been waiting for the perfect moment. And the perfect moment has come, the scarcity um, has sent the value of our intimacy skyrocketing. And of course he means their sexual intimacy, but he just also means looking at her and talking to her and communicating with her and being with her and just their relationship. They can't wait to be together. He uh, says in verse 14, and now he's speaking first person, uh, he says directly to her, my dove in the clefts. Uh, she's been at home. She's been waiting. She's been in hiding. He says, my dove in the clefts of the rock and the hiding places on the mountainside. Show me your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. And so he's come up to this place and he can hear her and she can hear him, but he can't see her. Uh, they're, they're still not quite together. And, and he pauses. And remember, balance and reciprocity are essential to all of this working. And as eager as he is to see her, uh, he pursues her and he begins to draw her out. But he wants her to come out. And he says, I haven't seen you in a while. I can't wait to see you. Um, and remember, he sees her subjectively. He sees her like no one else sees her. He sees a woman that he, can, he can't look at any other person on earth the way he looks at her. Your face is blue, beautiful. Your form is beautiful. Your voice sounds like no other voice to me. Like, I just can't wait to see you. And so all this scarcity has created all this incredible desire and this moment of anticipation and this tension um, of her coming out and them seeing each other. It's just like, you know, one of those love movies where they're at the airport and they go sprinting across and they hug each other. It's kind of kind of like that. And of course, scarcity is good, but he seems to recognize that too much scarcity is bad. And every once in a while, you know, the, overall these poems are very hopeful. And, and they're, they're very much about vision. And, and they're instructive and even corrective to us simply by telling us the truth and, and making us live, live up to that with our lie. In other words, telling us the truth, telling us how it should be, letting us see how our reality is, recognizing that there's a variance between the, tr the two, saying this isn't the way it should be, this is the way it should be. Let's repent, let's cover the transgression, let's get 
uh, let's get to the higher mountain. It accentuates the positive and almost entirely eliminates the negative. But every once in a while, a verse is thrown in here or there to give us a warning, to give us a sense um, that this will lead us back to the garden, but we're not in the garden again. This is not Adam and Eve before the fall. This is two people who are finding their way back to the garden, but in the midst of a perilous and evil world. And so this scarcity has come upon them, and it's led to a good thing because the desire that is built up, they're aiming at one another. Um, But he recognizes, and the poet does this very purposely, verse 15, because he recognizes um, that too much scarcity, um, too much delay is very dangerous. In verse 15, he says, catch for us the foxes. Those little, clever, guyful little thieves um, that ruin the vineyards. Our vineyards, our body, our sexuality that are in bloom. Who takes our God-given desire, our God-given affection, our God-given sexual needs and presents for us a counterfeit, a false thing to meet those needs rather than the real thing. He's saying, I've been out in the woods. I've been out in the field. I've been out in the business world. I've been getting my work done. I've been bringing home the money. I haven't been with my woman. My desire has been rising, and these little foxes are trying to get me, but I'm coming home to you. And it's a reminder that we need each other. It's a reminder that um, we shouldn't be so spiritually minded that we don't recognize that we have earthly needs. Uh, About three days ago, uh, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning. And if you ever hear me talking about waking up at three or four in the morning in the middle of the night, uh, it's always from God because I don't wake up at three in the morning. I might be up at three in the morning, but if I'm up, if I wake up at three in the morning, that's, that's not me. And usually... I'm not really happy when it happens, even if I feel like God is trying to speak to me in the silence of the night, because usually it's not good. If he has something happy or good to say, that usually comes after my coffee and my quiet time. When he has something he really wants to get my attention with, it happens at 3 a.m. This verse was on my mind, and I woke up at 3 a.m. with this verse on my mind, and I felt like the Lord said, I need you to pause on that verse, and I need you to talk about some things, because I am very, very grieved about the state of some of our relationships within the body. And the way the clever and guileful one has gotten in there and usurped, the proper devotion that a man and a woman, a husband and a wife have for each other and the terrible, terrible consequences um, of such a thing. The Apostle Paul says, New Testament, and I don't really like the Apostle Paul when he talks about marriage because he kind of talks down to people who are married. Have you noticed that? If you've read the Bible, you know that. He says, you know, if you, if you, if you don't need to get married, don't get married. Um, it's better if you don't get married. That's what he says. What a jerk. He says, it's better if you don't get married and you just marry God and you do what he wants you to do because if you marry a woman, she's going to make you do what she wants you to do. And if you marry a man, he's going to make you do what he wants to do. And you really shouldn't get married. You should marry God and you should be celibate. And, you know, all this is my paraphrasing of what Paul says. And I'm not married, so I don't really get marriage and you guys shouldn't be married. And it's scripture, so I have to deal with it as truth. But then he finally says, but if you can't stand it, then get married. It's better to marry than to burn with lust, which gets about 99.9% of us off the hook. Um, But even with uh, what I consider his lower view of marriage than what I have, and even I think my perception of it couldn't be true because God has a very high view of marriage, um, he did understand some things. One of the things he understood um, was that though our spirits are willing, our flesh is weak, and deprivation is a terrible, terrible thing in a marriage. Uh, He said in one place, uh, absolutely do not deprive one another. Based on the principle that your body is not your body alone and his body is not his body alone, uh, you belong to one another. You are one body, one spirit, one flesh. And so Paul was very clear, do not deprive one another except by mutual consent. Mutual consent. Not one person saying, I don't want to do it. Uh, Mutual consent. And then he said, only for a time so that you can pray, consecrate yourself, have a quiet time, 
have a Sabbath, fat, whatever, for, for a set amount of time, set apart for God for spiritual reasons, and then even set a time in snow when this is over and you can get back to business. He said, and do this because if you don't do this, Satan is going to come along and he is going to tempt you. And Paul was speaking to a Christian audience. Paul was speaking to equally yoked couples. Paul was speaking to people who had been washed in blood, filled with the Holy Spirit. He could have said, and maybe what we feel like he should have said because we, we were so puritanical in our thoughts, he could have said something like, the strength and the integrity of God that lives inside of you should cause you to be faithful even when you don't get what you want, which may be to some degree true. But he also said, you know what? Your spirits are willing, your flesh is weak, uh, and you can't do this. And if you're married, you need not to deprive one another. You'll destroy the marriage marriage. And by the way, it was an equal statement when he said it. Um, not only is he tempted, she is tempted. It may be in different ways. It manifest, may manifest in different ways, um, but ultimately the romance perhaps she needs and the sexuality he needs or vice versa, whatever you need is not going to get met except through this union. And he said that, and he was basically recognizing what, 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 what the male recognized in this poem, what the poet is trying to make True to us is that deprivation can lead to, uh, to unfaithfulness. And unfaithfulness is absolutely arsenic to trust, to vulnerability, to intimacy, to a marriage. Uh, the moment, um, one bout even, of unfaithfulness, whether it be adultery through pornography or adultery through a physical relationship, is mean, it doesn't matter. The, the moment that we fall to the temptation of adultery in whatever form, um, we leave the category of personal subjectivity and enter to the category of objectivity. And, and, and we give our affections over to and our intimacy with objects rather than a person. And, and, and it tells he or she, it tells them um, that they are not personally sacred to them anymore, but that they are an object. And, and it is absolutely devastating to trust. It ends vulnerability, it ends openness, and it will destroy, it will destroy a marriage without the grace of God, repentance and forgiveness, and the miracle of the resurrecting power of the cross, that marriage is destroyed. Now, where sin does abound, grace does more abound, and God has a plan for that. When I woke up at 3 a.m., he wanted me to tell you that, but he also wanted me to tell you this. He wanted me to tell those of you who are single here, whether you've never been married or whether you're divorced or whether you're widowed, he wants me to tell you as well that you can equally commit adultery to any married person in the room. Adultery um, is sex apart from marriage. And if you're single and you have sex apart from marriage, you are committing adultery against God, against yourself, and against the person you're with. And check this one out, against uh, your, your future spouse. You're giving away something that belongs to them to someone else. Paul also taught, this is, I know you guys are loving this, Paul also taught that when, when two people come together, even if it's frivolous, even if it's for one night, even if it's with a, a man and a prostitute or a woman and a prostitute, even if it's pornography, under whatever circumstances, when, when two come together, they become one flesh. And he says, when you sin in this way, you don't just sin against God and you don't just sin against another person, you sin against your own body. You sin against your own body because, because you, you come together with someone and what, what physically, what emotionally, what spiritually happens is, is the two become one, one flesh, right? And so you could be a guy or a girl off at college. You could be a guy, a uh, young uh, adult out in the city. You could be a single person and you could be in a, even in a monogamous relationship without the covenant of marriage. And you could be in this relationship and you could think everything is fine because you're like 99% there and, and this is pure even though the Puritans wouldn't say it is. And you could think you're doing just fine. But here's what happens. You're in that relationship day after day, year after year without the covenant of marriage. And when the hardenings come along because there's no covenant, you don't make it through the storm. 
The Bible says a cord of three strands is not easily broken. When I do any wedding, I quote that because the covenant that exists between a man and woman in the church under the covering of Christ is not just his commitment to her and her commitment to them, uh, him. It is, it is their commitment to Christ and, and Christ's commitment to them. And the cord of three strands is not easily broken under the most intense of pressure. When you don't have that, com- uh, that, that covering, when you don't have that protection, uh, when you don't have that strength, then ultimately the relationship's going to end. And when the relationship ends, uh, the, the two fleshes that became one go back to being two fleshes again. Now, how do you take one flesh and make it two? How do you do that? You rip it in half. You rip it in half. And, and you leave all kinds of unhealed wounds. And so you rip this flesh in half, and apart from the resurrection and healing power of God, which does exist, you carry around these scars, and they remain undealt with and unhealed. They even go dormant. Sometimes they cause great pain. Other times the pain is simply just by going numb. And you fall in love with somebody, so to speak, different day, a different time. You marry that person. They're committed to you. You're committed to them. You do it all the right way. And then you go into your private place and you have your intimate times. And all of a sudden they touch something that hurts. And you have a flashback and you have a remembrance. And they touch something that hurts. And as soon as they touch something that hurts, you recoil. And when you recoil, one little cut, one little slice at a time, death by a thousand cuts, when you recoil, when you back off, when you go numb, when you don't participate, when you're not all in it like they're in it, when it's not reciprocated, then all of a sudden the reciprocation is not there. The vulnerability is unrewarded. Uh, The affection and desire is unreciprocated. Trust begins to unravel, and ultimately intimacy is destroyed. You are committing adultery in the future. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and I felt like the Lord was saying, I am grieved because there is, Brian, you would be shocked at how much sexual sin exists, not just in the church in general, but under the roof of your church. And you're over here in the book of Acts, and you're, and you're trying to build the body of Christ, in a right relationship with Jesus and one another for the purpose of glorifying him and doing your mission on earth, just as Acts would lead you to do, which is a really good thing. But but it's like God said, I stopped that. I put that on hold. I put that on pause. I pivoted to this book because it's useless to try to build unity in the body, body and affection between brothers and sisters when the most basic unit, the nucleus of all those relationships are a husband and wife, and they're in so much pain. So much sin, so much unrepented of, so much undealt with, so much continuing to go on, so much rationalized. And you're over here wondering why brothers and sisters can't get along with one another, and it's because they can't even go home and look each other in the eye and have an honest conversation about what's going on in their hearts. And so I know I took a jettison off of this, but I feel like the Lord wanted me to take a jettison off of this. He wanted to remind us that there are consequences to all these things. And the reason that there is a moral code in Scripture is not because God is high and mighty and condemning everybody on earth. This is not a political speech. I don't care how you vote. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. The world is going to do what the world is going to do. Christ is still on his throne. What I care about is, is what happens here among the brothers and sisters of God, the, the husbands and wives who, are, who claim to be Christians, I care about what happens in the Lord's house and the sanctity and the purity of his people. And this vision that he's given us, this hope, this ideal, even under the worst of circumstances, is absolutely never, ever going to happen unless we repent. We need to confess our sins to one another. Don't just confess them to God. In this particular case, you need to find someone you can trust, and you need to confess your sin to them. The Bible says if you confess your sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Upon a forgiven sin, the Holy Spirit falls, and all kinds of healing it begins to rush in. Not only do we need to confess, we need to ask for God in the context of that to give us the power to repent, to refrain from what we've been doing wrong and begin to do what is right. And in the context of all of that, the power of God will provide what we don't have. 
and begin to make us perfect in this way over time and restore not only our capacity to have a clear conscience before him, but to have a right relationship with one another, a husband and wife, a man and woman under the covering of God. In verse 16, this is where it gets awkward. I may not make eye contact with you for a while. We're going to pivot here. She begins by saying, my beloved is mine and I am his. This isn't going to happen to us. No adultery here. We're locked into one another. We're going to overcome this. And then she says, then she gets, she gets, well, she gets a little naughty here. She says he browses among the lilies. This is, this is kind of an awkward turn here. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, she says to him, turn my beloved and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the rugged hills. Now, I've looked at a lot of different commentaries. I've looked intently into the scripture. I want to know what it means. I want to avoid what it means if possible, if I can stay with the main point of the sermon, but I can't. I've got to tell you what this means because it actually makes an important point as we clo- close. I'm not going to tell you what every single metaphor is here. I'm simply going to say that this is erogenous and oral. There, I said it. And so some might say, well, this gives us permission uh, to act in these ways. And I would say, indeed, in the context of a love relationship between a man and woman, if you trust each other, if the vulnerability is right, if the relationship is right, then not only does it give you permission, it seems to give you an endorsement. God's word, not mine. Um, But I would also say that this is an unmandated endorsement. In other words, just because it says you can doesn't mean you have to. And just because it says you can doesn't mean it's right. I would say in direct proportion um, to the righteousness of the relationship, we should be experiencing freedom. Uh, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And what he meant by that is to fulfill you, fill you with the Spirit of God, with the love of God. And once we have a perfect love relationship with God and a perfect love relationship with one another, uh, then we no longer need the law. We don't need rules. You don't have to worry about breaking rules when things are right. But when things are not right, you've got to be a little careful. You need some guidelines. And so I would say what this verse is saying, what it teaches us, the application is, in direct proportion to the quality of the relationship, we should enjoy freedom among one another. We don't have to have all these rules. If the relationship is right, go wild. Break barriers. Explore. Have fun. Dive in. Whatever. I didn't mean anything by that. (laughs) Whatever you want to do. But if the relationship has been broken, if trust has been broken, if you're in a process of healing and restoration, then you need to go slow. You need to make sure that it's subjective and not objective because the same act that can be pure can also be perverse if it's from the wrong heart. So it's not anything goes. It's anything goes under the covering of love in the context of God. And he created this. And he created us to enjoy one another. He did not just create sex for procreation. He did not just create sex as some mechanical, instructive thing uh, so that we're close together and we have babies. He created sex for our mutual enjoyment, for our intimacy, for our pleasure, for our celebration. Strangely enough, though it's difficult for us to cross categories, uh, when this is right, he is glorified. And I think that's why the enemy has worked so hard to bring lies and to bring perversion to objectify and to lead us down the wrong road in context of this relationship because he knows when a marriage is right, when the nucleus is right, the other relationships are right, children are born, new image bearers take their place on earth, and God's glory is extended around the world. And if he can turn this around, if he can reverse this, he can own us. And that can't be more true anywhere on earth than it is within the body of Christ, within the church. Um, let's, just, let's just pray. Close, let's close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you so much for this time and this place and this space to be together. We thank you so much that you speak to us through your word in ways that are very important and very precise. We thank you so much, Lord, that you don't come to condemn us. You come to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. I thank you, Lord, that that this message isn't just for couples who are trying to get it right. 
This is for couples who have also gotten it very wrong. This is for people who are divorced and need grace. This is for people who hope to be married one day and haven't always had it right up until this day. I thank you, Lord, that your correction and your instruction isn't for the purpose of condemnation, but it is for the purpose of restoration and new hope. Lord, I praise you and thank you that through your word, through conviction, we are not uh, bound up with shame, but we are released from shame. I pray that you would bring clarity. I pray that you would bring boldness. I pray that you would bring love. I pray that you would bring power into our relationships. I lift this congregation up to you, and I pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in each and every area of their life. And I am convinced that this poem represents a vision for your will for us on earth well before heaven. Jesus, if you can make us a bride that will appear before your throne without blemish or fault in a perfect relationship with you, our groom, then we ought to be able to begin to reflect that between husband and wife here on earth. I pray that you would graciously uh, pour, that, pour that grace into us, give us that power, give us the spirit, and make this happen. I pray that with all of my heart. I pray that not one single person would leave here feeling, feeling condemned, that not one person would leave here um, without hope. I just pray that every single person would leave here with incredible hope and optimism about what you have for us in the future. Lord, we, married or not, we're all, we're all, we're male and female. We are the sexes. We are sexual. Almost nobody in this room is called to be alone. Almost nobody in this room is called to be celibate. You have made that so clear to me. And so I pray that you will meet that need. I pray that you will meet that need in a way that is holy and that is righteous. Resurrect the marriages that currently exist and prepare the hearts of every single single person in this room for what you have for them in the future. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you in advance for answering these prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.